Welcome back, Eco Nerdlings. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about yet another buzz phrase in environmental science global warming. So, what are the effects of global warming? Well, between 1979 and 2005, average Arctic sea ice dropped about 20%. And this is shown right here in the blue hues above. So, we have the North Pole, Greenland, and this is where ice is still frozen and hard. But as you see this light blue area right here, this is where all of the melting is starting to occur. So we have a heat transfer through the way of conduction. This is when warm air holds more moisture than cold air, and during conduction, heat and moisture from the ocean or land moves into the atmosphere. For example, cold air moving over warm water, like a lake, starts to form a steamy type of fog. So when this causes rising air currents and it leads to cloud formation. It also takes heat from the lower atmosphere to the higher atmosphere where pressure is less and it causes air to expand, which in turn cools the air. Then the air cannot hold as much moisture because it's cooler, so the clouds form condensation. We also have radiation and radiation is what drives weather. Heat from the sun actually warms the earth and this radiates back into the atmosphere. So we also have a scattering effect. So as the sun hits the earth, molecules are scattered into the air and this changes the direction of heat coming in. Some are scattered back up into space, but others are absorbed. This is actually what makes the sky blue. We also have the albedo effect. This is the proportional reflectance of Earth's surface. So for example, glaciers and ice sheets have a very high albedo and reflect 80 to 90% of the sunlight that hits them. However, asphalt and buildings have very low albedos and they reflect 10 to 15% of the oceans and then forests reflect about 5%. So as far as solar radiation goes, absorption, 70% uh, of solar radiation that falls on Earth is absorbed and it runs the water cycle, drives winds and ocean currents, powers photosynthesis, and it also warms our planet. So it can also control temperature. When there isn't a lot of moisture in the atmosphere and it's a very clear night, we have a large temperature drop, like in the desert. But when there's a blanket of clouds, the temperature pretty much stays uniform. So in the desert, that's where I grew up in New Mexico, uh, during the day in the summer, it might get up past 100 degrees, but because it was very, very dry and there wasn't a lot of clouds at night, it could dip into the 50s and the 60s. So there was always a huge temperature fluctuation. Now I live in the Houston area and there's not as much as the temperature fluctuation from night to day, especially in the summertime when it's really hot and humid. So that's, you know, Big differences whenever there's a lot of humidity and cloud cover versus a very dry area where there's not a lot of cloud cover. So we also have rising sea levels. So during this century, rising sea levels are projected to flood low-lying urban areas, coastal estuaries, wetlands, coral reefs, and barrier islands and beaches. So this is a prediction right here that scientists have come up with, low, medium, and high. So low prediction, everybody will pretty much be okay. Uh, medium prediction, if we have a rise in about 50 centimeters, more than a third of the United States wetlands will be underwater. And if the high projection is what actually occurs, then New Orleans, Shanghai, and other low-lying cities will be largely underwater. So if the seas rise anywhere between 9 and 88 centimeters during this century, most of the Maldive Islands and their coral reefs will actually be flooded. So changing ocean currents are also a concern. Global warming could actually alter ocean currents and cause both excessive warming and severe cooling. Thunderstorms might actually be a result of this as well. So thunderstorm, <laughs> thunderstorms are characterized by high cumulonimbus clouds that can reach 50,000 feet. An updraft of warm air causes cold air to rush downwards. This is why you feel a sudden cold breeze right before that thunderstorm hits. And then lightning causes that ozone smell. So you always say you, know, you can smell rain. That's pretty much what you're smelling. So there are obviously problems that are associated with thunderstorms. 
Uh, it includes rain, obviously flooding of a lot of areas, streets. Uh, we can get hail that can damage uh, not just our property, but you know they can inflict wounds on us. Uh, lightning, high winds, and then, you know, every once in a while we do have a loss of life that can occur. Tornadoes can also occur. These are powerful rotating funnels of air associated with severe thunderstorms, and tornadoes form when a mass of cool, dry air collides with warm, humid air, producing a very strong updraft of spinning air on the underside of a cloud. It is a tornado if the spinning air descends and actually touches the ground. So tornadoes can destroy buildings, bridges, and freight trains. They can even blow water out of rivers and small, and small lakes, leaving them completely empty. Tornadoes kill a lot of people. More than 10,000 people in the United States have died in tornadoes in the 20th century alone. And they are most common in the Great Plains and Midwestern states, especially Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, as well as states along the Gulf Coast of Mexico. So hurricanes are something that we have to deal with here in the Gulf Coast. Uh, they're giant rotating tropical storms with winds of at least 74 miles per hour, and they can reach up to 155 miles per hour. They form as strong winds pick up moisture over warm surface waters of the tropical ocean, and then they start to spin as a result of the rotation of Earth. The spinning causes an upward spiral of massive clouds as the air is pulled upwards. So of course, there are many problems associated with hurricanes. They're very destructive when they hit land, not so much because of the wind, but because of all the flooding that occurs. So they can flood buildings, they can cause tons of property and water damage, uh, lots of debris can get you know, scattered everywhere, we can lose power, and then of course we also can lose human life. So what are some of the effects of global warming? A warmer troposphere can actually decrease the ability of the ocean to remove and store carbon dioxide by decreasing the nutrient supply for phytoplankton and increasing the acidity of ocean water. Global warming will lead to prolonged heat waves and droughts in some areas and prolonged heavy rains and increased flooding in others. In a warmer world, agricultural productivity can actually be increased in some areas and we'll see a decrease in others. Crop and fish production in some areas will be reduced by rising sea levels that could flood river deltas. And then global warming will increase deaths from a several different causes. Number one, the heat and disruption of the food supply. And you'll see these effects more in developing countries versus developed countries. And you'll see a lot more spread of tropical diseases to temperate regions. And you'll also have a huge increase in the number of environmental refugees. So climate change is such a difficult problem to deal with for several reasons. First of all, the problem is global. If it was just occurring in the United States, or just occurring in China, or just occurring in Australia, it would be much easier to deal with. But because it's a global problem, it's very difficult to get all of the countries in all of the world to be on the same page, because all of the countries are at different phases. You know, in a developing country such as China or India, they're more concerned with putting food on the table and making you know, a living from day to day than we are here in America where we have a little bit more leisure to worry about bigger problems like this. Um, the effects will last a long time, so it's not something that can be changed right now. Uh, so all of the things that we're doing right now are going to affect us for many, many years to come. And the problem is a very long-term political issue. There's also harmful and beneficial impacts of climate change, and they're not spread very evenly. Some areas are probably going to benefit from it, while many others are going to you know, receive negative effects, so all of the flooding, the droughts, and things like that. And there are many actions that might reduce the threat, but a lot of them are controversial because they'll impact economies as well as our lifestyles. And let's face it, in America, we like excess. And a lot of the strategies for helping us deal with global warming are going to include us decreasing our, you know, our productivity, decreasing the amount of resources that we're using. So dealing with global warming, uh, there's two ways, through mitigation, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and through adaptation, where we recognize 
that some warming is unavoidable and we devise strategies to reduce its harmful effects. So solutions, obviously we have prevention and we have cleanup. Now prevention is obviously going to be much easier than cleanup. So as far as preventative measures that we can take, we could cut fossil fuel use, especially of coal. We could shift from coal to natural gas, but as I've stated before, there are many issues with natural gas as well. We can improve energy efficiency. We could shift to renewable energy resources, such as wind turbines. We could transfer energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies to developing countries. So basically the developed countries like the United States could help developing countries such as India and China. We could reduce deforestation. We could use more sustainable agricultural and forestry. We could limit urban sprawl. We could reduce poverty and we could help slow the population growth. So as far as cleanup goes, we could remove carbon dioxide from smokestack and vehicle emissions. We could store carbon dioxide by planting trees. We could sequester carbon dioxide deep underground. We could sequester it in soil by using no-till cultivation and taking cropland out of production. We could sequester carbon dioxide in the deep ocean and we could repair leaky natural gas pipelines as well as facilities. We could also use animal feeds that reduce methane emissions by belching cows. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about global warming. You can rewatch this or many other videos at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.